If you look at the inside of our mouths... What makes human speech organs unique is the low positioning of the larynx. This airway uh, is quite different in a human and a chimpanzee. It allows us to produce a few extra sounds, uh, vowels e, a, u, also consonants like g, k. A working speech organ provided benefits beyond those of a language made up of gestures. Though a spoken language you can communicate at night, uh, if you're speaking, your hands are freed so that you can use your hands to demonstrate things, to make tools, and all of the things that we use our hands for, and we can speak at the same time. Scientists now know that Lucy's speech organ did not resemble ours. Her larynx was positioned as high up as that of a chimpanzee, but her descendants, Homo erectus, had a larynx much better suited for speech. It had started to move down, and something significant had happened to their brains. They were twice the size of Lucy's. When you look for cerebral asymmetries, they're very, very clear on this. Um, it's showing Broca's caps in a more human-like kind of condition and it's 1.8 million years and is associated with stone tools. And I think this allows you to speculate reasonably that perhaps language is primitive, but is there by about 1.8 million years ago. The possibility of Homo erectus having acquired language skills is supported by genetic evidence. This is FOXP2. FOXP2 is a really remarkable gene in order to study the evolution of language from a genetic perspective. Because it's the first single gene that we know of that if, some, if something goes wrong with it, you have rather specific effects on speech and language. I was senior. I was um, West Thames College. At we now know that a defective FOXP2 gene has a huge effect on the power of speech. I work at working at Heathrow Airport, Tongue 1. Okay. What do you do there? What are you doing? At first, scientists believe that the FOXP2 gene could explain why humans have been given the gift of speech. In humans, in the last six million years, this gene that changed almost not at all during mammalian evolution changed at two positions, which is relatively a lot. If kind of nothing happens for so millions of years, and then all of a sudden you have two amino acid changes in this, in this gene. But we now know that the gene is not unique to us. Scientists recently acquired genetic material from Neanderthals and discovered that they too had the same language gene. So we do not know exactly when these mutation arose and when this advantage occurred during human evolution. But it must have been the, because amino acid changes are also found in the Neanderthal, so it's probably before the split of humans and Neanderthals, say maybe 300 to 500,000 years ago. Presumably, Homo erectus also possessed the modern version of FOXP2, as genes that we share with the Neanderthals should have been present in our common ancestor. It is likely that erectus what with its large brain, had crossed a language threshold. But what caused this? What had caused Homo erectus's brain to increase in size? The stock answer is that we'd gained access to a more protein-rich diet, meaning more nourishment for a hungry organ. Your brain consumes 20% of your daily food intake to keep it going even though it's uh, uh, only 2% of your total body weight. But there may be more to it than just new eating habits. Scientists have introduced another theory about what caused our brain to develop, citing a correlation in primates between brain size and group size. The greater the number of individuals in the group, the greater the size of the brain needed. The way primates group, bond their social groups is by grooming. This is a very one-to-one -one activity. And the problem with that is it imposes a limitation on how many people you can get together in a group. And if you have very large groups, like 
we have come to have, then there isn't enough time to go around grooming everybody. So we had to have some mechanism for using the same amount of social time that primates use for grooming, but use it more efficiently so that we could reach more people. According to this gossip theory, language became our way of grooming each other. And according to Robin Dunbar, we can tell that gossiping is the primary function of language based on how we use it. We went out and we observed what people talk, listened to what people talk about in pubs as here or in railway stations. And there we found that about two thirds of the conversation time is devoted to social things. You know, who I am, what I like, who you are, what you like. And only about one third is devoted to all these other topics, politics, religion, the theater, culture, sports. All these other topics take up a very, very, relatively speaking, small amount of time each compared to social topics. <laughs> If humans had retained the way apes maintain relations, we'd have to spend 40% of our waking time grooming each other. As we come through time, group size really doesn't change very much. Just one or two extra individuals, maybe in small numbers. Robin Dunbar claims that towards the end of the era of Homo erectus, the groups would have reached a size where traditional grooming would take up too much time. But at, at, from about one and a half million years ago, the, towards the end of the Homo erectus period, things start to increase very rapidly. And suddenly, you're adding more and more individuals. But even if Homo erectus and the Neanderthals acquired language skills, finds suggest that their speech organs were not on a par with ours. What they would do to have a language which would lack sounds like e and oo, so uh, produce sounds like. <coughs> you'd have a sound like uh, duh, ne. And the words what I'm doing, I'm nasalizing slightly, and I'm not producing an E or an O and an Evidence suggests that proper articulated speech was introduced by modern humans here in Rift Valley. It wasn't until between 50,000 and 100,000 years ago that we started leaving behind signs of culture. In the future, we'll most likely find other genes governing language and speech, and we'll start to find differences between Neanderthals and us. Genes that might prove that it was our advanced language capabilities that allowed us to outlive all other hominids. Language is the vehicle of communication. It's a vehicle of thought. It is impossible to think of anything in which language doesn't uh, play, facilitate human activities. And Darwin pointed out, as soon as you change uh, a factor in evolution, everything else changes. In just a few years, a lot of what we've been taught about the human evolutionary journey has changed. We now know that the Savannah theory is incorrect. We were bipedal before we even got there. And it didn't take long for us to start walking the way we do now. Lucy moved almost like a modern human being four million years ago. Scientists have shown that the original human language may have been a language of gestures and not of words. And it baffles the mind that our modern language skills may have developed as a tool to aid group cohesiveness, with members talking about themselves and gossiping about others. The journey of Homo sapiens continues, but can we predict where we'll end up? In the final program in our series, we'll meet scientists who maintain that we are still evolving and that it's occurring faster than ever before.